That software is not available, and there's a really good reason. It's top secret. Why would the government release the most important software we have running on satellites and running in the ground stations? Why in the world would they release that? We Do we really want the Chinese and the Russians to have this software? <music> Greetings to the brightest audience in the country. This is Real Science Radio. I'm Fred Williams. And I'm Doug McBurney, Bible student, science geek, amateur comedian. It's great to be back with you, Fred, talking about real science on Friday. So on our first show of 2024, we aired our first Man on the Street interviews, where we began by asking, do you believe in a flat earth? And we mostly left that question hanging as a prelude to the show that we're going to do today, where we plan to review a debate that Will Duffy had with two flat earthers, Austin Whitsitt and his compatriot, Jaron Campanella, who is one of the most well-known flat earthers out there. Now, Fred, first of all, I can't believe that we're actually discussing this. I, I thought that the question of a flat earth was laid to rest. I mean, at least for Western civilization, sometime around the late 15th century at the latest. But now there's this growing interest in in flat earth there are youtube channels on it and and the, the odd thing fred is that i mean aside from the obvious you know the pothead gamer types there seems to be quite a few christians that are advocating for the flat earth so doug you're exactly right i've noticed a lot of this stuff on youtube and they seem to be getting a little bit more sophisticated in their arguments they're employing all kinds of tactics that under the surface are vaporous and illusionary but more than enough to convince someone who's, you know, gullible and hears this stuff and they think the way they present it, they act like they really know what they're talking about and they act like they actually know the science. So for the sake of time, I'd like to do a few things related to the debate between Will and these two flat earthers. So first, we're going to deal with a couple of Will's arguments that he presented against the flat earthers. I want to show you their responses. It's going to be really interesting. Then we're going to talk about this particular flat earther's biggest claim of evidence against the globe. We're going to address that. And then finally, and most importantly, we're going to finish up explaining why flat earth belief leads people to hell. Yes, yes. And, and so, uh, Fred, I tried to watch this four hour debate. And, and, and I, last week, Fred, you talked about the bullet ant bite. Do you remember that? <laughs> the bullet ant bite. I yeah. mean, you guys said this is the source of the greatest pain on the planet, <laughs> that it basically compares to walking across hot coals with a three-inch nail driven through your heel. Something like that. It was really <laughs> bad, right? Well, yeah. I would. <laughs> I just want to say I think that the flat earth debate, I, I think it probably beats the bullet ant, the, the hot coals, the three-inch nail, all of it. <laughs> so... So, I think I, I, I got to agree I, with you on that one. I, I can tell by the, uh, the notes that you sent me that it seems like you, you, you watched the, the entire debate and you, you had the patience of Job. That's all. Yeah, it was, it was tough. It was a four-hour debate. So, But Doug, before we dive in, are you ready for the interesting fact of the week? Oh, that's right. The interesting fact of the week. Of course, I studied, Fred. I'm ready. <laughs> okay, here we go. Due to its gravitational pull, what generally happens to the human body when the moon is directly overhead? You get a little taller. <laughs> Sorry, Doug, not quite. You know, that's one of the multiple choice answers I was going to give you. Oh, no, you that means I'm just the average moron. <laughs> I hope to avoid that classification. But there uh, you know, that's a good guess, though, but it's actually you'll weigh slightly less. So there you go. That's the uh, interesting now, fact that of the week. that makes sense. Yeah, right? It, it, yeah. It like, like when a tornado, you get that little lift. I don't know. You live in Colorado, right, Fred? Yeah, yeah. We don't get a lot of tornadoes here, but we do get some, especially on the East Plains. But yeah. One time I was driving across I-70 and a tornado came and all of us were heading for the overpass. And there was this mad dash to try to get under the overpass. I couldn't get there. 
And I, I felt my car suddenly, everything became weightless for a second, and then everything went back to normal. And oh, it was terrifying. Man. Were you terrifying. by yourself? Yeah, yeah, I was okay. terrified. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So anyway, but, so I should have known the answer to that question anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if uh, the listening audience knows we talked about it on uh, a couple shows ago that you actually had a tornado in San Diego. So Yeah, but that, that was just like a cute Southern California tornado. This one in Colorado, <laughs> I mean, the hail was going sideways. It was terrible. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have them here okay. on the Gulf Coast, too. Okay. Ah, Pete Fisk. Pete Fisk speaks. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I'd like to bring on to the show Mr. Pete Fisk. He's been involved in this flat earth debate for some time, for a long time. Pete's also actively involved in presenting uh, young earth creationism. So he's, I thought for this show, it'd be good to get Pete on the show because he knows a lot about the flat earth arguments, the flat earth community. He's had to deal with them. So, Pete, welcome back to Real Science Radio. Thanks for having me, Fred and Doug. Well, it's great to have you, Pete. Can you tell us, uh, quickly walk us through how you got involved in the uh, Flat Earth debate? Okay, well, uh, a number of years ago, probably about 2015, um, I got acquainted with a specific Bible app that I thought the guy that was the creator of the Bible app, he had it uh, tattooed on his car. So I, I friended him on Facebook and we, uh, we started chatting on the phone. This guy's name was Robert Forscht out of uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. So uh, he started talking and he said, oh, I'm not the creator of the app, but I promote it. It's a good app. I said, okay, well, yeah, I agree. Well, long story short, we started talking about our backgrounds and I told him I'm an engineer by training. You know, I'm a science person. I believe in, in young earth creation. I uh, used to be, I'm a former evolutionist. And uh, he said, well, I'm, you know, I, I don't have a science background. He said, he started telling me about uh, he had a drug problem. He was on drugs, and he was a recovering drug addict. Okay, that was nice. And he found Jesus. That's cool. And uh, But then he started talking about all these conspiracies. And I said, okay, well, I, I, a red flag started going up. And then he said, oh, do you, by the way, the earth is flat. I, and I started cracking up. I said, really, man? I said, uh, that's a good thing. No, no. And he was dead serious. And I'm <laughs> like, are you serious? Really? And then he, he started talking. He started saying all these weird things about how we were how we've been programmed by NASA and the Freemasons and the Jesuits into yeah, believing yeah. the Earth is flat. I mean, around a sphere. And I'm, I'm saying, OK, no, I don't think so. Oh, yeah, Pete, I'm, I'm sure. Yes, we, you are. And then he, he invited me to check out this guy named Eric Dubay. Well, I checked out Eric Dubay and watched a couple of his videos. That's all I could stomach. And as it turned out, I did some background checks on Eric DeBay. Eric DeBay, as you as you guys probably know, he's not a by far he's not a Christian. He's actually uh, calls himself a, a pagan, uh, a Buddhist. He lives in Thailand. He practices uh, kung fu. Nothing wrong with martial arts. I was a martial arts guy at one time, but he does it religiously, and he also does yoga, and he also denies that Jesus existed. And he's also a Satanist, which he doesn't tell people. So this guy, yep. this is, go ahead, Doug. Yeah, it, it, this is some a leader in the movement. I, unfortunately, I'm yeah, not. Yeah, Eric DeBay is the de facto uh, false messiah of the of the flat Earth movement. He actually wrote two books in the early 2000s, or maybe the 2010s, around 2014, I believe. One called the Atlantean Conspiracy, and the other one, uh, 200 Proofs for a Flat Earth. And he posted them on an ebook, I think on Audible. I went through some of his uh, some of his material, and it's verbatim what modern flat earthers, including other flat earth false teachers, teach. And and what a lot of Christians are are falling into, obviously, which you, which you found out. Yeah, and if I may, most of the flat earth teachers now who follow Eric DeBay or have have, have gotten their material from him call themselves Bible-believing Christians. The late Rob Skiba and uh, uh, Robbie Davidson, and I believe Dave Weiss is, is a former, is Jewish, but I think he calls himself a Christian now. And others, prominent flat earth false teachers, claim to be Bible-believing Christians. And it's this lure, they're very uh, serious. Dean Odell, by the way, is, he's a pastor in Opelika, Alabama. 
He is a flat earth pastor with a prominent online following. He's the one that debated Greg Locke in uh, Pastor Greg Locke in Nashville. And long story short on that, yeah, Dean Odell is is a very he's got a lot of followers. And there's a lot of so-called Christian flat earth teachers out there that are poisoning the minds of gullible, and I hate to say it, of our fellow brethren who don't have a lot of depth in their faith, and they're easily taken in by this lie. Yeah, you know, Will Duffy, that's what got him involved in this too, kind of similar to you, Pete. He was talking to a friend on Facebook, and they mentioned this thing about flat earth, and I, from what I recall, Will thought they were kidding, and then they, he realized they're not kidding. And so Will's gone down this two-year path of just taking on this flat earth uh, argument, this flat earth movement, and so... He recently, as mentioned earlier, he had a debate with a couple of flat earthers. And I think that's something that's going to be fun to jump into. And, you know, it's kind of a theme. I found this quote, and it's from a guy from Boston University. His name's Lee McIntyre. And this is so true. I mean, and you'll see this as we go through Will's debate with these two flat earthers. So Lee said this, flat earthers seem to have a very low standard of evidence for what they want to believe, but an impossibly high standard of evidence for what they don't want to believe. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And and, and that's something, by the way, Fred, Pastor Bob Enyard and I, for many years, we did a yearly show on the negative effects of marijuana. And that's almost verbatim. Uh, something Bob said about the pot legalization advocates and and the pot advocates, the marijuana advocates in general. You know, they would accept the most ludicrous assertions about how good marijuana was, but you couldn't get them to ever admit that there was any problem uh, with someone smoking dope. Anyway, oddly enough, it's almost like the confluence of... uh, of uh, of a couple of uh, civilizational uh, events coming together, the the legalization of marijuana in the mid two thousands and uh, interest in flat Earth by twenty twenty four is through the roof. Uh, anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah I think uh... there's a correlation there uh, to some because people, you know, when you're when you're not thinking straight, <laughs> and when you when you don't have a foundation, a firm foundation like. I think we guys, all, all three of us have in, in scripture and science, I think that, that it's easy to, to just believe any fast-talking con man. And all these flat earthers are flim-flam people. They, are, they really are. Yeah, and, yeah. and uh, that's a, a great segue to just remind everyone that it's the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that inspired the scientific revolution. The Amen. reason we have the scientific method is because Christians believe that God's creation was discoverable, logical, reasonable, and that it could be discovered by us, and that God made it for us to discover. So I just want to get that out there. Yeah. The uh, founders of modern science, Isaac Newton, uh, J- Robert Boyle, James Lister, just to name three, uh, Johannes Kepler, were all Bible-believing creationists, uh, not, not evolutionists. And, and creation is the foundation of modern science as opposed to being anti-science. Now, we as creationists, I've talked to Jonathan Sarfati, he's a friend of mine, and Jono basically said, this is another front that biblical Christians, biblical creationists have to fight now. Not only do we have to fight the evolutionists, or the, the, I don't like to say fight the evolutionists as much as the lie of evolution. Now we got to fight the flat earth lie on top of it. Satan is a master tactician in these yeah. last days. Hey, a quick aside, Pete, you and I, the first time we met in person was at a uh, Answers in Genesis conference, and that's where we first met Jonathan Sarfati, and he was playing people at chess. This guy was a world-class chess champion. He beat Bobby Fischer once even. He was a champion of New Zealand. And he played yeah. like seven people blindfolded backwards, yeah. uh, you know, where he's not facing the board. And your son, I'll never forget, he Nick, took yeah. his queen. Yeah. And it, was it Nick? Yeah, yeah, it was Nick. Nick yeah, not Andy. It yeah. was Nick that took his queen. Yeah. Yeah, Nick took his queen. And yeah. Sarfati, there was a pause. So after he takes his queen, Sarfati, and you, his back's, yeah, his back's facing the table, he goes, huh. Just the, yeah. That's all yeah. he did was, huh. 
<laughs> yeah. Of course, Sir Fadi came hey, back and right. still beat him. I, I reminded Jono of that, and he goes, was that your son? I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, you called him well. <laughs> so, okay, so we're going to play a brief clip, and this is where Will Duffy in this debate, he shows a map of Australia alongside the Flat Earth version of Australia, and it's pretty hilarious. So for our listening well, audience... Well, before the, you do that, Fred... Let me put put something in here. There are flat earthers out there. I've encountered one on on the internet. I won't name him, but uh, he's real. He lives in Maryland. He denies Australia exists. There are flat earthers that deny <laughs> that Australia exists. They say that all 26 million Australians are paid actors. I kid you not. <laughs> I kid you not. That's unbelievable. Wow. So, okay. That's, uh, that's interesting and not surprising. So, for our listening audience... The flat earth version that Will shows of Australia, it's shaped like a hot dog. So, you know, it's like much thinner across the horizontal. Uh, it's so, anyways, I'm going to play this clip from the debate. Why can't we just get a map of Australia that has the right scale and looks the right shape? Why? C- can we ask you though, what, what, every single map that's ever been made, every uh, coastline that's been mapped has all been done by government money, kings and queens. There's no private person going out and building maps, but you expect Austin and I to do that from our house. We're just supposed to go out and map the world for you. So right away, Jaron appeals to you know a government conspiracy. I guess that's not a big surprise. It's one of their many stock answers. And let's just call this their, I'm going to call it their dark matter magic wand. <laughs> that's a good one, Fred. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, Jaron is wearing a baseball cap emblazoned with a giant pot leaf and and a, and a, and like the official THC logo. So kids, first thing, don't take drugs to get high. They make you stupid and paranoid. And so Fred, I will bet dollars to donuts. I, I'm not saying we're going to fund Jaron and Austin's efforts to go out and map coastlines, but if someone were to fund a legitimate study a sociological study, we will find a direct correlation between the interest in flat earth and the legalization of marijuana. I'm I'm putting that out there. Maybe someone else can fund it. I'm going to key this up really quick. Hmm. Gentlemen, which brings me to my next point. Don't smoke crack. (laughs) There's a true that. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) So, okay. So in this next clip, Will tries to get them to admit the globe version of Australia is way closer to the truth. So let's listen to Jaron's reaction and particularly how he starts his very opening reaction. It's interesting. I would be content if you and Jaron would admit right now that the globe shape of Australia must be way closer to the truth than the Gleason map because of these flights. No, I'll I'll never say, but if you... If you want to, if you want us to draw the Earth for you, to draw the map for you, then you just need to get us the source code for GPS and explain to me why it's hidden by the United States government. It's just a GPS space; it just tells you where you're at. But you get this: if it is changing things and telling people to adjust for the globe, then we would not know that, and they would hide the GPS source code, which is exactly what happens. So, give okay. me that source code, and I'll be able to tell you all the transformations that they've made from the real Earth to the globe Earth. <laughs> wow! So okay. no. I, I was paying attention, Fred, and and so J- Jaron has to stop himself from basically saying, I'll never believe that. Nothing will ever convince me. So his mind is obviously already made up. You, can you play that again? Okay, I'll play the very start. Yeah, that's exactly what he, he catches himself. No, I'll, I'll never say it. <laughs> yeah. I'll never. I'll never admit it no matter what. Yeah. So – I'd like to comment on this one uh, starting off. So note that he mentions GPS. You know, Ryan and I talked about GPS last week, and I was intimately involved with GPS at my job at Trimble. I was the lead engineer at Trimble of a team in the telematics division. So uh, my question to Jaron is, am I being deceived or maybe am I part of the conspiracy? Of course, the ground GPS that he refers to, that that software is not available, and there's a really good reason. It's top secret. Why would the government release the most important software we have running on satellites and running in the ground stations? Why in the world would they release that? We Do we really want the Chinese 
and the Russians to have this software. So he then claims, and I'll say really arrogantly, that if the GPS satellite and server code was available as open source or whatever, and he can get his hands on it, he would be able to find the transformations the government put in the software to make the earth look like a globe. So he's basically accusing all those engineers, including GPS pioneer and Bible-believing Christian Ron Hatch, of lying in some grand conspiracy. And again, you can go back and listen to the show last week that Ryan and I did on the GPS myth that it requires special relativity. And Fred, you know, I used to work here at Ingalls Shipbuilding, building destroyers for the U.S. Navy. I worked on the Phalanx guns, gun system on, on the destroyers, on the uh, Ticonderoga class and Arleigh Burke when they first came out. Long story short, though, you know, the Navy has to be in on this worldwide, this this flat earthwide conspiracy, doesn't it? Every Navy and every engineer that worked for the Navy, we're sworn to silence. I mean, you know, I get my paycheck. Sometimes I get it from NASA. Sometimes I get it from the Catholic Church. Sometimes I get it from the Freemasons. We're all yeah. paid. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So are the Chinese in on it? Is Kim Jong-un in on all this conspiracy so, you know, and the thing to me, Pete and Doug, is do you realize how incredibly complex it would be to put software in the satellites to transform locations such that, you know, it takes four or more satellites to get a good GPS fix. So this software has to be running in all these satellites and more than just four. You can use more satellites to establish a position by, you know, improving the uh, error, you know, error recovery to get an even more precise location. So you'd have to converge. All these satellites would have to converge on a spot and have this all this complex software, these transformations, to send you know the GPS uh, the GPS signal to the receivers. The receivers get like position, distance, time, the, the ephemeris, all this data to achieve triangulation and to to locate a fake location on the globe that's really a flat Earth. It really is truly a flat Earth, and it's going to fake it to look like a globe. You know, I can't imagine how hard it would write to write software like that and to test it. And then you could just for a moment compare it to their conspiracy claim that NASA has faked these photos. I mean, I guarantee you it would be many orders of magnitude, if not impossible, to write software to fake GPS locations. That's how ridiculous this claim is that this Jaron made. It's it's remarkable. And yeah. so many people they won't know that. Uh, you know, they'll just kind of take it hook, line, and sinker. Oh, this guy must know what he's talking about. I bet you that guy's never seen a line of code. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> and, well, here's the thing. You know, Fred, he he blames government money, kings and queens. So he immediately appeals to, I mean, most people today have a tendency to not automatically believe the government about just about anything anymore. And so he he, he appeals to that. And he's basically implying that the modern day CIA and the, the king and queen of Spain back in 1400, they're all working for the same dark forces. And, and Fred, he might actually assert that if he were asked, you know, did Isabella and, and uh, uh, Comey, did they all work for the same conspiracy? They, they might say that they did. So anyway. Depends it, how but, high he is, how many hits off his bong he took. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Fred, this this uh, this appeal to uh, the conspiratorial tendencies of so many of us. It, it's uh, I like your I like your uh, dark. It's a dark energy rescue device. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Yep. So another point. Will shows how airline travel times clearly match the universally accepted map of Australia. Later in the video, he even shows, you know, space pictures of it from the Japanese weather satellite that uh, they send that sends these really cool signals. I want to talk about that in a, in a moment. But so they reply by appealing to automatic programming and how the plane is engineered to change altitude, optimize air resistance, all to match the programmed flight times between cities on their hot dog shaped continent. So this Austin guy, Austin Whitsett, I think is his name, um, he makes the just so claim that magnetic declinations explain all these map anomalies for a flat earth. So to me, Doug and, and Pete, 
and you'll relate to this. I, I view a flat earther as magnetic declination. It's no different than evolution is convergent evolution. Or maybe, and I, you know, sorry to my Calvinist friends, the anthropomorphism magic wand. Maybe, guys, we call this dark matter rescue device. I mean, yeah, it's I, just I another think, rescue. I think, you, de- I think you've coined a term, Fred. <laughs> I mean, how many times has this guy in the debate mentioned magnetic d- declinations? I don't know. We could look at the transcript. And I bet you it's at least five to ten times, maybe a dozen times. He just pulls that out of the air. He gives the illusion that he knows what he's talking about. Well, Fred, can I just say that uh, the the kid on the on the far right, the the kid with the beard, Austin. Yep. I, he's not a stupid person. He's not a dumb person. He's he's a no. he seems like a, a smart guy. I think there's a lot of flat earthers that that are probably not you know average intelligence, but they've just been deceived by a strong delusion. You know, Satan is a masterful. Uh, con artist he can he can make somebody believe a lie very simply i mean we've all fallen for something in our lives you know we've all been tempted at something and and it's not just that people are are dumb a lot of them are i would i like to say illiterate not necessarily dumb but but the thing is that a lot of people you know satan is a masterful tactician and and he can pull the wool pull the wool over and at, uh, just about anybody's eyes, unless you have the Holy Spirit, you know, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world within us and operating through us. So I think we, we need to keep that in mind as well. As I watched the portions of the debate I watched, I th- Austin came across to me as a Christian because, well, he spoke about creation. And as far as I can tell, nobody speaks about creation in a positive light except Christians. So even with the Holy Spirit, he seems to be a bit deluded. And Fred, I think you you mentioned the Japanese satellite earlier. This is probably one of the greatest uh, exposures, uh, mechanisms of exposure for how many machinations you have to grasp onto <laughs> to believe yeah. that there's a flat Earth. Uh, it's called uh, Himawati 8 and 9. It's a weather satellite, right? Right, Fred? Or, or a couple weather satellites. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I want to talk about that here in a second. So one other point I wanted to make about Austin, and he is a smart guy. Note that he is a little bit bothered by this whole, you know, everybody has to be in on the conspiracy. He's sensitive to that. So he tries to explain that away. So he takes a different angle than this Jaron. You can see that there is a slight tension, uh, just a little bit, that he doesn't agree with everything Jaron says because he's uncomfortable with having to think so many people are in on it. And earlier in the debate, you know, he appeals to similar physics, you know, like with satellites and a globe or flat earth. And basically that guys like me, we're not in on the conspiracy because it all just works. The physics is the same for both flat earth and the globe. And we wouldn't be able to tell. Well, that's silly. That's not true. Um, I've already talked about how GPS, you know, there's no way you can make that thing fake a globe. But what he's missing, though, when Will brings up all the flight times in Australia, you know, he can't play that card there because these pilots, they know they're in the plane. They know the flight speed, the time it takes to get somewhere, how fast they're flying. Yeah, it may be on automatic pilot. Sure, no problem. Because his argument is, well, they just program that in there and then that's they get to where they need to go and the flight times are going to be you know, programmed in, even though you only don't have to go as far on the hot dog shaped Australia. Well, he's basically accusing every pilot in Australia of being in on the conspiracy because pilots are smart people. That's, you know, that's why they're, you know, they have a, a job with a major airline. He's accusing them of being in on the conspiracy. And, and Fred uh, and Doug, um, you know, I don't know if people really think about this a lot, but you know, the, the Gleason map that the flat earthers use where, which centers on the North pole, and flares out, you know, the longitude, the uh, latitude lines, uh, you know, latitude is the same all over the globe. But when you consider the fact that that what they're basing, the you know, the Gleason map is based on an azimuth equidistant projection, which is a tool that geographers use to to measure the linear distance on a, on a curved surface, the curved surface of the Earth. Now, you know, there are several azimuth equidistant projections. If you go to the to the ESRI, ESRI website, you know, the guys that created ArcGIS, you will see there are different projections. There are 
azimuth or flat earth projections centered on Antarctica. There are flat earth projections centered on Africa and North America. You can make an azimuth equidistant projection centered on any continent or landmass or even on the water on, on the from the spherical earth. So the fact that they just use the North Pole projection, I'm not quite sure why they do that. But that's you know that's the one that's on the U, on the United Nations flag. But it's 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 just a geographer's tool. It's not even a real thing, you know. You know that seems to just go over their head. Wow, good point, Pete. Now back to the satellite. So Japan and I wasn't aware of the, the satellite that they launched. It's super cool. Will brought this up in the debate. We'll play a brief clip on this also. But Will's point with Japan's Hippowori 8 and 9 weather satellites, he makes the really good point that, you know, these things were created to save lives and to see if hurricanes are coming. And you'll see that the, what happens is the flat earthers, they'll deflect and talk about how meteorologist weather balloons are used, which is a textbook straw man. We don't deny that weathermen send up lots of weather balloons, you know, so Jaron shows all these, these references to weather balloons being sent up. We don't deny that. So it's a complete straw man. Will points that out to him in the debate. So the, what's cool about this, this satellite, and you can go on their webpage and just look at the most recent snapshot that will be within, I think, 10 to 20 minutes. And it takes a full image of the earth and an entire hemisphere. And it's doing this all the time, which is just really cool. So I'd like to go ahead and play a really quick clip of this. This is really famous. <laughs> this is the Hunga Tonga volcano. And the Hunga Tonga volcano uh, is in the middle of the ocean. It's actually underwater. Mm -hmm. And so this, it, th this volcano erupted. And uh, because it was in the middle of the ocean, no one really knew that it happened until That's not how that works, bro. Se <laughs> seismic. Activity. They have buoys out everywhere in the ocean. They can oh, know when there's on. a change it's, at all. No, it's no. A cool story. Sounds good. No, it's it's not a cool story. This is real. This is a real picture. It's a real event that happened. Seismic uh, activity would absolutely know it happened. Hold on. Uh, I, I I knew you guys were going to say this. Um, what I what I'm showing you right now. Uh, is the second eruption that happened and caught everyone off guard because after the first eruption, they did all of their science and they declared it dormant. They declared it dormant. And literally days later, it erupted again and no one knew that that was going to happen. Okay. And okay. so within, within minutes of this happening, we have a photo of it. And you ready for this? Here's the fascinating thing. Uh, the sound of the eruption was so big, it reached New Zealand, but it took two hours to reach New Zealand. So we actually had a picture of it before the people in New Zealand even heard the initial eruption. That's how powerful this satellite is, the Himawari 9. So guys, as you can see right away, they're denying it. It's uh, and, and by the way, the Hunga Tonga volcano, Doug and I are familiar with that because we had Dr. Paul Homan on in December with three really good shows on climate change. And if you haven't seen those, you got to check them out. Fantastic shows. So Will makes a point that, you know, people in New Zealand, they heard the explosion of this volcano. And so 24 seven, we're getting these images and Will was able to go back and show like when that happened. And then people in New Zealand hear this thing, you know, a little bit later, it's just, it's pretty cool. And like he said, it saves lives. This yeah, thing yeah. is designed to save lives. And, and, and notice how in the debate, uh, Will Duffy wasn't afraid to kind of hang it out there, Fred. And he actually admitted that Austin was right about Japanese standard time being plus nine hours. <laughs> so Will was willing to admit at least uh, that they were right about at least one fact. And then later in the debate, he admits something else. I forget. He admits they're right about something else. I don't think they admitted Will was right about not even a single fact. Yeah. You know, the flat earthers, they'll bring in things that are true, you know, and it's like, uh, sure. you know, we've said as creationists that rat poison is 99% good food. It's that 1% that kill you. And anybody who's a con man, they'll mix in a ton of truth to get you to, you know, believe the lie, yeah. basically. So that's how and, religious okay. cults work. Yeah. And yeah. that's flat earth as a cult. It is a cult. 
It's it yeah, seems absolutely. it seems that way. But but Fred, you mentioned earlier that uh, Austin takes a little bit of a a, a different tack than uh, Jaron, perhaps. And I think this next clip that you're going to show, I think this reveals Austin's discomfort a little bit. Zoom in on their website and see the little purple stitched lines on the thing. There is no purple stitched lines on these images. Well, I've certainly zoomed in myself We've on their website. Them. There are little purple hold, lines. Hold on. Hold on. Let's test the theory. So I want to I want to zoom in on this picture. Do you guys care where I zoom in? No. No, okay. but it's can when you, you can you do an older one? The actual the actual main one on the website that's supposedly there live. Okay. That's not the photo. Right. So then they just render, they just render it together. No, no, no. Yes. They don't render anything, Austin. You can download the 400 megapixel pictures like this one and look at, I'm zooming in right now to Australia. There are no stitch lines. These pictures are incredible. Yeah. So notice how Austin, he's really seems to be squirming now and, you know, making this claim of, uh, he can see this (laughs) blue stitching. And this is where Will in a follow up, interview on another podcast said that he must have a low resolution screen. And that's where I kind of based on what uh, Doug and Pete's point about marijuana. No, I think he might've had a hit off a bong or something (laughs) because it's obvious when you zero in on the, on those images and you can get a 400 megapixel image. There's no, you know, stitching on these things. And, you know, they think it's stitching because it's all this information allegedly being created by the weather balloons that were sent up and they're actually generating these images. So I want to play this next clip. So stay tuned for this guys on uh, additional squirming. NASA has nothing to do with this. I just want people to know they can go back to 2016. There are hundreds of thousands of images of earth, high quality. You can download all of them. You can look for stitch lines. You won't find them. All the weather patterns are accurate. If a hurricane is about to hit, hit Australia, you can see it on here. Okay. So again, I'm fine. Okay. But you think the images can't be faked. So that's, that's weird position in my opinion. He thinks it's weird to think that those are real images. So yeah, I guess yeah. we're the weird ones. Huh? And uh, wow. did you notice Fred, uh, physically, literally, and empirically potheads always use too many adjectives. Just as they're trying to connect the, <laughs> the next thought there. You just, they yeah. use adjectives in order to, to buy themselves time to think a- anyway. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and, and it's it's the fanaticism that flat earthers, uh, Christian flat earthers uh, portray. You know, I make the point that I've made the point the other day to someone that uh, if we could get regular Christians who know the earth isn't flat to be as on fire for Jesus as flat earth Christians are, about trying to promote their lie, uh, their the flat Earth lie, we would say it would bring a lot more people into the kingdom, because because I have I mean there's lots of Christian flat Earthers I've encountered who said I became a Christian because of flat Earth, and I said well that's nonsense because Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh to the Father but by me that's John fourteen six so how can you know Jesus didn't say and by the flat Earth and you know by the way you know whenever the Bible mentions in, in Isaiah 40, 22, you know, Isaiah, the, the King James says the circle of the earth. All the modern English mm-hmm. Bibles use that word circle. But if you, if you go back to creation.com and look up the Isaiah 40, 22 article, they make uh, the author, I can't remember who it is right off the top of my head, makes the point that the word, the Hebrew word, which is kug, K-H or K-hug, as you say, Fred, um, is, is actually a word meaning sphere or circle, just like the Hebrew word dur, D-U-R, or kadur, which is also used for, to, to describe ball or, or flat disc, So the, because Hebrew is very malleable. So, so the idea that the Bible even mentions a flat earth, let alone the other 200 supposed verses, is, is just nonsense. Really good points, Pete, because this can lead people away from salvation, from right. finding the truth. And so that's going to be part of, I'm glad you mentioned that because I wanted to end this show when we get to that point on really the title of the show, The Hidden Dangers of the Flat Earthism. And the other title that we have is for our, you know, on our thumbnail on the YouTube channel is The Flat Earth Guide to Hell. Because there are consequences in pushing views like this. And, you know, the other day I mentioned to my son that we were doing this show and he had a good question too. He's like, what advantage 
do they gain by getting people to believe in a flat earth? You know, if you think about like evolution, there's a reason, you know, evolution leads people away from Christ because it questions the very foundation of the Bible in Genesis. Origin of life, what does that do? It questions Genesis. All of these, the age of the earth, what does that do? Where does that attack the Bible? Genesis. So if if the flat earthers are right, how does that, where is that attacking the Bible? It really isn't. There's no, I don't see, my son was asking, what advantage do they expect to gain to get people to become a flat earther? It's the opposite. It actually can lead people away from the truth. And again, we're going to sum up the show at the end because those are important points to make. So yeah, thanks and, for sharing and, that, and Pete. Fred, I just want to, uh, before we get there, I just want to warn you. <laughs> So I'm going to give you some of those reasons because I have had a conversation with a Christian flat earther recently, and those were questions I had. And so I I will, uh, I'll touch on those responses when we get there, but let's, let's check out. I know you, we got at least a couple more clips from the, from the debate, right? Yes, we do. So later in the debate, Will gets to what he believes is his favorite argument against a flat earth. He makes some really great points with it, and it's the Southern Hemisphere flights. So I do want to show a brief clip on that. So, And I know, Pete, that you've got some information on this argument against the flat earth on Southern Hemisphere flights. Yes. Um, Robert Carter from Creation Ministries International, he did an article a number of years ago on this very thing. And he points out on the article very clearly if you check, if you go online and check uh, Qantas, for example, the Australian airline, and you check their flights from, I believe it's Sydney to Johannesburg, you know, the, it doesn't make any sense in terms of, of distance uh, and, and time, the time taken. If you do the calculations on how fast a 747, which is what Qantas uses to fly from uh, Australia, from, from Sydney, I believe, or maybe Perth. To, to Johannesburg, it, it only makes sense if the Earth is a globe. The time and, the, you know, the fuel consumption, you know, you have to calculate all these things that the airlines have to cal- calculate these things because it's, it's you know, it's a safety issue as well as a profit issue. You know, they make money off these flights, so they can't be over, to- over the time, you know, as well as, you know, you can't run out of jet fuel in the middle of the Indian Ocean, you know. So, so this this only makes sense that the time that it takes a 747 to fly from Sydney to Johannesburg only makes sense on a globe Earth. Exactly. And, you know, Will makes this argument really eloquently in the debate, and he uses even his, you know, his background in finance and just the economic advantages of why certain flights will go up to North America. But he also makes a brilliant point on, an emergency landing that occurred on one of those flights where the flat earthers would have to believe that flight went over Canada. And, you know, they, they really squirm on that one. And this Austin guy, he appeals to again, magnetic declination. And I wanted to play that clip really quickly for you guys. Austin, can you show me on a flat earth map? Can you just show me on any flat earth map that you want a flight going from New York to New Zealand that goes over Canada? Wait, Bro, said, first of all, what I said was, do you understand that if the Earth was flat, that the flight could go over Mexico still? He says, no. Oh. How, can you show me that on a map? That makes no sense to me. Why? Because the way that we fly is that we, we update with our directions using magnetic declination. <laughs> well, he invokes his rescue device, magnetic declination. Wow. I think that's just a buzzword with him. I don't think he knows what that is. Yeah, he probably doesn't. I mean, maybe he does. I mean, he is a smart guy, but he's obviously misusing it. And again, I think if we looked at the transcript on this show, he's probably used that at least a dozen times. And it gives the illusion to people watching this video. I know what in- I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And well, it's really so unfortunate. I, I don't want to criti- I don't want to criticize the guy because I, I never heard that term. Is it is it a real thing? Yeah, it, it, it is? is. I mean, I I did Google it. Um, Okay, so it yeah. does, at least it exists. So uh, it does exist. Yeah, I mean, Earthers not in the do way that he... a lot. They they like Eric Dubay. He'll 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 throw a lot of terms out there, and even for for someone seasoned like me and Fred on in science, uh, you, you sometimes we have to go back and look at some of the terms to get refreshed. But but they use a lot of terms. They do before they make videos. Uh, they they use a lot of terms like magnetic declination. 
to to make themselves sound intelligent, smart, and educated. That's the way a lot of uh, less sophisticated, I'll put it, Christians fall into this trap. They say, oh, this guy really knows what he's talking about. Then they quote a few King James verses, and then they say, well, this guy's, you know, he's a Christian or something of that nature. And it's it's really insidious how these flat earth con men, how, how they're being used by Satan to, to ensnare the minds of Christians, of Bible-believing Christians, many of whom are our brethren or self-professing brethren who are, who are just not scientifically literate. Okay, well, yep. I, I'm just going to confess right up front that I was biased by the THC hat and the use of the term bro so that I didn't look up <laughs> magnetic declination. I, I wasn't compelled to. Hey, yeah. bro. Yeah, he says bro. You know, that's another thing in the transcript. Somebody, <laughs> I bet your bro was used about 50 times. Will, at one time, towards the end of the debate, and I, you know, I wish I would have stopped it at the time I was listening to it. You know, when I I'd just gone to bed, listened to it in bed, and so I didn't have a place to write down. Will at one point goes, he says, "Bro." <laughs> <laughs> oh, he sucked Will into it. Oh no. Oh well, I don't think he sucked in, him into it. I think it, he could have been. Will was just having fun. Oh, bro. oh okay. Yeah, that yeah, sounds well, he, more you realize like this, it. Uh, southern hemisphere. I don't smoke weed, but I I use the term "bro" occasionally. <laughs> but uh, yeah, nothing wrong with it. But it's just funny how well, he uses that. Austin uses it throughout the debate. And well, then we'll find at one point. Well, let, let, me goes, just, let me let me put a finer point on this. There's a there's a finer cultural point that 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 uh, people our age might miss, and that's when the term is pronounced bra 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 bra. Then you know <laughs> bra. you know that that he's uh, high on pot. Yeah, hey bra exactly. or hey, has, bra. has been yeah. recently. Hey, I wanted to play just one more clip. You are making the positive claim that something is out in space. A certain distance away, taking pictures of a globe in a vacuum. That's what you're claiming. You're claiming the radius of the Earth, the mechanics of the satellite to be out there, the medium that it's in, that it's out there to be able to keep going, that the Japanese government is completely trustworthy and accurate, and that these are real pictures in a vacuum. That's your claim, right? And so there again, Fred, you know, they like to appeal to our common ground that none of us really automatically trust the government on everything anymore. But now they're saying that we can believe that the deep state can efficiently doctor all these images in real time on the fly, <laughs> even between governments. And so, yeah, yeah. so they're, 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 and, they're and for centuries, Doug, and for centuries. That's right. This goes all the way back to Queen Isabella. <laughs> I would bet they, they actually believe that Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand were on NASA's payroll. Yep. Yep. All, 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 it was all the, the no. Was it the Bilderbergers or maybe it even goes before that? But yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know another point that uh, Jaron tried to, you know, present as a rebuttal to Will's claims is why are you only getting the images every twenty minutes? Because Will mentions that he knows that he, a friend of his is somebody that is one of the uh, I don't know somehow they were involved in this project and I apologize for not remembering the details of that part of the debate and you can always go listen to the debate even though it's tough to listen to four hours of flat earth <laughs> but, <laughs> but this guy he gets this data fed from Japan he has a I guess his own feed of this information that that these satellites the pictures they produce and they're like well why is it 20 minutes? Why does it take so long? Because, you know, information travels at the speed of light. You know, inf I can send an email and it'll be in Japan in two seconds. I can send an image, it'll be there in 10 seconds. I mean, they're so desperate. I don't know how the software works. It kicks out these images to the live feeds or different uh, feeds across the world. I think Will said it's every 10 minutes that this thing refreshes. And then I guess the feeds go out every 20 minutes. And what, regardless, I mean, there's going to be processing time. There's going to be a, a system. I mean, you can't, obviously, if you're sending it out to multiple places, you can't send it to multiple places at the same time. I mean, if, if you can, that's, you'd have to have a supercomputer running a whole bunch of different threads, but it's beside the point. Let's just say that you can send that out rapidly, like Jaron says. He's got to assume in that 20-minute window that this other supercomputer that Austin talked about is actually using data from the weather satellites and stitching these images together, and that's what we see. It's, it's all the weather balloons. It's not the satellite that the Japanese sent up. 
and the right. Japanese are either in on the conspiracy and they've got... Fred and, and Doug, if you think about it, the images always have a curve in them, right? If you would stitch all these little images together, they all have a curvature. I thought the curvature didn't exist. <laughs> yeah, true. Well, and by the so. way, Fred, they are implying that that 20 minutes is being used for exactly what you just said. And if, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. I think this is one of the other points in the debate where Will just concedes that he doesn't know why it takes 20 minutes. And he, and he doesn't try to back and fill and defend it with any, anything. He just says, well, I don't know. Well, and, and yeah. so, yeah. so anyway, uh, so Will's not afraid that there are some things he doesn't know. And of course they fill that with, well, because you don't know, you're buying into all these presuppositions that have been laid out by the CIA yeah. and everyone who's trying to. So anyway, it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's, difficult to watch and the purple stitch lines by the way i think austin might have been seeing those in jaron's thc hat in between the green leaf and the, <laughs> and the logo yeah i think you're right i think we got to zoom in on jaron's hat i think he's got purple <laughs> stitch lines I, I don't think that hat's yeah, real purple stitch lines on his head. <laughs> i wonder yeah yeah okay so we're getting kind of low on time i wanted to get to the flat earthers they presented evidence for a flat earth Obviously, if the Earth is a sphere with a radius of 3,959 miles, that means it's curving at a certain rate. You can't say, I don't care about the size. No, because the map you just invoked wouldn't be real if the size wasn't correct. Your distances between places wouldn't be correct. Your gravity wouldn't be correct. Your day and night cycle wouldn't be correct. That number has to be exactly right. You can't be claiming you're going to send satellites into space or doing anything because they use a radius of orbit, which is actually a distance above the surface, added to, of course, the radius of the earth. Okay, so we, are, we went out and tested that number because we knew if that number is provably wrong, all of these other claims, reifying and presupposing that number are also intrinsically wrong. The falsification of the radius value is the falsification of the entire model, right? Okay, guys, so here, this Austin Witset, he presents evidence from sunsets at Canigo Peak. This, it's a mountain in France. And he says this, and I, I'm quoting him. He says, it debunks the whole globe, bro. <laughs> bro, bro. I, I got, you know what, guys? I got to play that clip. Let's watch this. This debunks the whole, the whole globe, bro. <laughs> it debunks the whole globe, bro. Come on, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I want to I wanna throw something in here, Fred uh, and Doug. You know, if you look at, at any, and I got, I've, I've shared a clip. Uh, a video of a sunset with a green flash on it to many flat earthers the sun sets what does that tell you i mean it, it goes behind and it comes up from the curvature of the horizon if the earth wasn't a sphere you know if it wasn't turning on its axis that you can't bring you can't bring the sun back with a p p1000 Nikon camera like the flat earthers always use. You can't bring it back, bro, bro. It goes over a sunset, goes over the horizon, and it comes up the next day uh, uh, in the east. And it's it, it's a daily occurrence. That in of itself proves the earth is not flat. Yeah, absolutely. And notice that, uh, and I played the clip just long enough so that you can see, it looks like this Jaren is using this. There's an online earth curvature calculator and you know what yeah. they're doing? They're messing. There's so many variables that play into this. And what they're doing is they're saying, oh, I can make this fit what I want it to fit by changing the radius. And so somehow that's their evidence. The radius of the earth is actually wrong. And it's only because they manipulated the data. They changed the radius. You know, these guys are not, um, are they really, how much physics do they really know? And regardless, they're playing with a number and there's so many other variables. It's it's a sleight of hand. It doesn't and if work. You, if you think about it, guys, um, you can use simple trigonometry to calculate the, the curvature, the, the circumference, the radius and diameter of the Earth. Uh, Aristophanes did it 2,250 years ago uh, in Egypt. You use simple trigonometry, and you can't fudge the trig. You can't fudge the trick. There's this, you know, there's a method, a methodology, a mathematical methodology that you use. And the, the problem is when, when flat earthers use this buzzword, was it eight, 
eight miles per per whatever curve. I can't remember right off the top of my head. They use these words. They don't really know what they're talking about because they're mathematically illiterate. They 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 just don't know what they're talking about. They use a buzzword. They use a couple of buzz terms. You know, a couple of you know catchphrases. But they don't know the math. I've actually done the calculations with using trig, and it's it's the you know it's it it mit, it matches. Uh, and that's what our entire yeah. navigation system, ships and planes, that's what they use. That's what's programmed into the computers, you know. So, so you know, the, the fact that the Earth yep. is a sphere is irrefutable, not just by the video and photographic evidence, but by the by satellites, by navigation, by airline itineraries. All of it proves the Earth is a sphere and is not flat. Yeah. And yep. I am, uh, I'll be the first to admit that I'm mathematically illiterate. I never made it beyond introduction to algebra. That's as far as I made it because I didn't like math and my government school allowed me to avoid it. And so I did. So I'm mathematically illiterate, but I've always assumed that there are people who are not. And they're the ones who make sure that my plane doesn't crash. And, th and they're the ones who calculate what time I take off and what time I land, and for my entire life, they've been correct. So I assume that, that, uh, the, that the mathematically illiterate actually have a grasp on the actual circumference of the Earth. But, you know, he refers back to this claim that he kind of makes this throughout the whole debate that he's already disproven the globe. And he, he's basically pretending that he already won that argument, and the rest of this debate is really kind of meaningless. He's just kind of He's condescending to share his wisdom with everyone at this point. And, and I'll bet you guys are engineers. I'm going to guess this guy is not an engineer by trade because I don't think he would last that long. And I would not trust him to calculate my arrival time at any airport on any anywhere on the globe. Lord, help us if he had anything to do with exactly. that. Yeah, because this is the way he approaches this by obviously fudging a one factor one little thing to claim, oh, the radius is wrong when there's so many other variables at play. It's a trick. It's a sleight of hand. And he just, that kind of uh, antics wouldn't fly in the engineering world. And he overlooks like that, or that quote we said at the very beginning that I'm going to repeat again because this is pretty much exactly what he's doing. Flat earthers seem to have a very low standard of evidence for which they want to believe but an impossibly high standard of evidence for what they don't want to believe. He doesn't want to believe all the stuff that Pete has been talking about, Doug, you've been talking about, I've been talking about, Will's been talking about. The GPS alone, just for me and being in that industry, there's no way that the radius is wrong. And there's, you know, they'd have to, again, they'd have to program that into the satellites and the ground stations and so all the engineers would have to be in on it. Guys like Ronald Hatch, a great Christian, who was really one of the founding fathers of the modern GPS systems. Um, he, came, he was the one who developed the, the, uh, the Hatch uh, filter on GPS satellites. So, so many things they have to avoid. They try to cherry pick things. And it's interesting. There's a clip in this video where Austin hypocritically accuses us of cherry picking the data. I'm going to play that clip really quick. I do think it's pretty telling that we presented one piece of evidence that ends the whole debate. It was dismissed. We show the eclipse, dismissed. We can appeal to possibility, appeal to incredulity, or just hand wave dismiss. And, we, and this is what globe earthers like to do. They like to cherry pick things that they think work good with their model, and they haven't figured out what flat earthers have to explain it yet. So a tad bit of hypocrisy there, wouldn't you say, guys? <laughs> a little bit, I think, yeah. All right. Well, we're pretty much getting close to out of time, but we want to get to the summary of the show that we mentioned at the beginning and really the title of the show, The Flat Earth Guide to Hell. So I'd like you guys to close each with a comment on this, and then I'm going to finish with something I heard from Bill Jack at a recent, uh, he gave a talk at our local creation group. He was trying to witness to Hugh Ross, you know, talk about, you know, because Hugh Ross believes in an old earth and nothing was coming through to him. And he said one thing at the end and a friend of him told him, hey, you need to ask Hugh Ross this question. And Bill Jack's like, well, I don't really want to ask that question. So Bill Jack instead just focused on all the arguments for a young earth. 
and was getting nowhere and, and made no progress. And he said one thing to him that at least made him pause. He just, he didn't know how to respond and he got uncomfortable. And I'm looking forward to sharing that. So, okay. As I mentioned, yeah, this, here's my position. Here's what I think why this is so destructive for Christians to be promoting this and for Christians to be believing this and propagating it. Cause that's why guys like Will and myself and Doug and Pete are concerned about this and having to take time to do a show, a couple of shows on this. So for one, these guys lend credibility to Professor Dave. This is that same guy who, oh. you know, makes ludicrous claims against like James Tour, who's like one of the foremost scientists in the world on things like the origin of life. So what these flat earthers do is they give him credence because Professor Dave also debates these flat earthers. And the fact that some of these flat earthers are Christian, it really gives us a bad name. So th there's that. And so um, I want to, uh, well, it's kind of on the Professor Dave note, asserting a flat earth causes people to dismiss flat earth Christians, or at least that flat earth Christian that they're hearing it from. They dismiss that person. And Quite possibly, they dismiss the gospel from that person, you know, and, 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 and then that puts up a barrier to the next guy who might want to tell them about salvation because now they associate the salvation meth message with the young earth message. And that's just an unnecessary relationship that we need not create now. I had a conversation with a flat earth Christian and his posi I asked him that question. What does the devil have to gain? And not just the devil. I, I, I invoked all of his uh, uh, scary monsters, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, uh, Barack Obama, James Comey, the CIA, the Bilderbergers. George Soros. Hmm. I said, what do they have to gain? And he told me that he said, listen, Doug, what you don't understand is millennials are very uncertain about everything. And the dark forces of Satan want to convince us that we're on a ball that's spinning at a thousand miles an hour and traveling through space at a million miles an hour. And it terrifies us. And, and by keeping us in fear with this myth that we're on this spinning ball, that everything's moving and nothing's stable. He said, they keep us in fear. And that causes the people of my generation to be harder to reach for the gospel. And so it, it, it took me a minute to get a hold of this because that's, mm -hmm. I, I can't conceive of that. Like the idea that I'm on a ball going a thousand miles an hour and going a million miles an hour through space, to me, that sounds pretty cool. It's like, wow, it's amazing that God can hold all this together. I would really like to look into that to try to discover how that could be. But yep. the the millennial generation, at least the guy I was talking to, and I think this goes for an awful lot of them. So many of the younger generation come from broken homes, so their entire worldview is very unstable. And Fred, I think they look at things a lot differently than you and I because of this instability created in their life very early on with the divorce of their parents. Um, and, and so anyway, I, I don't want to be too hard on these guys. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they are mistakenly assuming and mistakenly asserting that the global earthism is propagated by the enemies of Christ. And, and earlier, Pete mentioned that a guy said he was led to the Lord. Or I forget what he said. He became a Christian because of flatter, something like that. And, and, and so Pete took issue with that. I, I think that's a little much because I've heard a lot of people tell me, hey, I came to the Lord because of creationism. 
creationism caused me to question the atheistic paradigm that I grew up in. So when someone says I became a Christian because of creationism, I don't think that it's because Jesus preached uh, that you had to believe creationism. And so for someone to say I, I became a Christian because of the flat earth, it could just be that a confused, unstable young person hears uh, a story that causes him to question the dominant atheistic paradigm and that they, they could become a Christian. I'm not, I'm not going to say it's outside of the realm of possibility. Yep. Um, because anything that causes a person to question the atheistic paradigm, anyway, it, it could be anything. So I don't want to be too hard on these guys. Uh, I, I, I think that the, the biggest concern is that we don't want to create barriers to the gospel. And I think on balance that asserting a flat earth creates more of a barrier than the relatively infinitesimal chance that it that it causes a young person to to question atheism and, and and end up coming to Christ so so to say that it that it leads to hell to me that might be a, a just a bridge too far that I wouldn't say that it leads directly to hell but on balance I think it has more opportunity to create a barrier that would lead more people to hell than to heaven. And for that reason, it must be discarded aside from the fact that it's ridiculous. <laughs> exactly. You know, one thing that occurred to me too is, you know, I was an old earther. I was a Christian, pretty carnal Christian and, and an old earther. And if I had heard the argument for young earth creation, and started thinking, oh, that might have some merit. And then the guy says, oh, by the way, also the earth is flat. I mean, this person would have lost all credibility with me. And so who knows, would that have kept me if something like that happened from getting into the Young Earth Creation Movement? Maybe it would have delayed it. Because when you get down to the bottom line with Young Earth Creation, we're defending the very foundation of the Bible. And we know that when that foundation's torn away, it leads people away from finding the truth. It's so important. Uh, you know, Paul mentions about, you know, how Jesus was a stumbling block to the Jews because the Jews already had that foundation in place. They already believed in God or definitely knew about him. Whereas to the Greeks, it was foolishness because the Greeks didn't have that foundation. You know, they were, many of them at that time, they weren't, obviously they weren't believers. They were, they, many of them were atheists or have some kind of pantheistic views. So anyways, you know that there's how many other unbelievers will see their debates, these flat earth debates and view Christianity as anti-science and anti-reason yeah, and then yeah. push them even further away from the truth. Yeah. And that, that's why I say, Fred, on balance, aside from the fact that it's ridiculous and impossible and I mean, borderline kind of crazy, um, besides all that, it, it's an impediment to the gospel. And I think that the, the instability in the lives of the young people that I mentioned earlier, and Fred, I don't think this can be emphasized enough. Divorce in a young child's life sets that child up for, for just disaster, just disaster. I, I can't even comprehend yep. what it would have meant to me when I was eight or nine years old for my parents to split up. I, I just can't even comprehend that in my mind, what that must do, because mm -hmm. anyway, to go from like this idyllic, wonderful life to just, I mean, so the, the kids, the kids are not all right. Okay. And, and so I think even those of us who came from stable backgrounds, we all have this fleshly desire to be, the reservoir of some privileged information, some esoteric information that, that, that only we have that we can share with the world. And there's a certain fleshly attraction to that. And I think, I think one of the explanations of the, the, the surge in interest in flat earth is that for the younger generation whose lives are, are just completely upset and unstable, 
there's a, even more a stronger appeal to this idea that I can have this almost secret privileged information and then I can share it with a, a, a group and then that, that their desire to create some stable portion of their life. And, and I think for a guy like Jaron, who I make fun of his pothead hat and all that, and I'll, I'll make fun of that. But for that guy, those 1,400 or whatever people who watched his uh, podcast, that is his source of stability in his relatively chaotic, unstable, drug-addled life. And so just... It's, it's an appeal to the flesh that has to be avoided. It's, you know what? One thing that I always loved about, what, one thing that Bob Enyar taught me when I was very young, we went to do a seminar that Bob put on. And I had just started working for Bob and I was familiar with talk radio and I saw Bob on TV. And so I assumed that there were millions and millions of people who were going to show up. Uh, because I, I was just young and naive. And we got to the hotel in wherever it was, Pittsburgh or somewhere. And like 130 people showed up and I was crestfallen. I was like, I can't believe this. You know, this is. And Bob was all excited and did the seminar as if I, I mean, as if he was a, as if he was in an NFL stadium. He put on, he put on this seminar. And at the end, you know, he, 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 uh, he enlightened me. That uh, he said, Doug, don't get hung up on the numbers. That's not. It's this isn't about going out and 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 getting as many followers as I can and 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 filling stadiums. That's not what this. This is about preaching the truth. And uh, mm-hmm. it, if you if you if you look in the Bible and you look at history, the history of the Bible, the the, the men who preached the truth, they they didn't fill the stadiums. As a matter of fact, a lot of them were relatively unpopular. Some of them were beaten. Some of them were killed for uh, yep. preaching the truth. And so um, I just want to uh, remind younger people that if you're looking for stability in your life, the stability is in one person. There's one person, Jesus Christ. If that one person is paying attention to what you're doing because he cares about you and he loves you, that's all you need to know. And he does. He does care about you and he does love you. And you only need that one person. You only need that. You need to be the follower. <laughs> You need to be the follower of that one person. And once you are, he's going to be your follower. He's going to be paying attention to you. And he cares about what you're thinking and what you're doing. And he cares about your mental stability and stability into your life. And he can bring you the stability. And you don't have to look for it in esoteric uh, secret information. And and, and, uh, I, I guess that's all I wanted to say, Fred. Yeah, well, amen to that, Doug. What a great point. Um you know, Jesus Christ, uh, having him as your savior, it's remarkable that so many people just step away from that because it's so easy. You just accept the free gift. Nothing you do, none of your works. You don't have to sing Kumbaya. You don't have to chant. You don't have to, you have to accept in your heart his free gift to pay for your sins. That's all you have to do. And then you're, you're saved. Your eternal soul is secure with Christ. So, you know, we want to implore the young earth creationists, the old earth creationists, any Christian who's listening to this. And if you're a flat earther, just I, I wanted to end the show with this one question because there are some, some really sincere and good Christians who somehow believe in a flat earth. And guys like Austin who are actively preaching it and just out there, and that's their thing. It's really important. They think it's important. And I I really do think some of these people really, you know, they really do believe it. And they're not wanting to mislead the masses. They think they're leading them to the truth. But I want you to just reflect on this one question. We all should as Christians. So when you meet Jesus, and you're a Christian, I'm not speaking to unbelievers at this point. You meet Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. Just how confident are you really and truly in your heart that Jesus will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant? And that's the message that Bill Jack shared at a recent conference. And that really put uh, Hugh Ross apparently in a kind of a 
didn't know how to respond to that. So I just, I think we should all reflect on that. What are you, how are you going to answer to Jesus when you meet him? And is he going to say, well done, good and faithful servant? Amen. Wow. So, wow, Fred. You know, the fact that Hugh Ross was uncomfortable with that and didn't know how to respond, that indicates to me that Hugh Ross is a Christian. He is. Yeah. 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 Uh, I agree. And and so just like so. a lot of these flat earthers, probably they're Christians, you know, and... and so I don't consider them enemies. I don't hate them. Um, uh, I, I might make fun of them for smoking pot, but that's only because I don't want them. To, I want them to quit smoking pot. It's it's not anything personal. Um, yep. But uh, boy, Fred, that's a that's a question that we should ask ourselves once a day about just about everything we do. So I really appreciate. Yeah. That. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. So and by the way, Pete, unfortunately, I had to drop off the call. Uh, he had some technical difficulties, but we were really happy that he joined us and was with us for so much of our show on the Flat Earth. Pete is so knowledgeable on this topic and on so many others. And I want to thank Mr. Pete Fisk again for coming on the air with us. He's been on Real Science Radio before. I think the last time we had him on was also on this very topic because he gets engaged with a lot of different people across the, you know, the spectrum and just really knows a lot about this. So again, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Pete Fisk. Amen. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Doug. So for Doug McBurney and Pete Fisk, I'm Fred Williams of Real Science Radio. May God bless you.